Hello, everyone. I see that people are starting to log in. Hi, Janine. I see you on there. We're going to give it some time to let everybody else log in. Hi, Courtney. I have everybody's mics off right now, um, just so it's not chaotic as everybody's joining, but uh, I see your names popping up. So nice to see everybody. Uh, hi, Courtney. Hi, Janine. Hi, Julie. Hi, Aaron. We're going to hang tight uh, to give everybody a chance to join us and uh, then we'll get started in a few minutes. We've got some more of you signing in. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I see people continuing to sign in. So we are going to get started in just a few minutes. Uh, it's about three minutes to 11 and we'll get started in just a few minutes. Okay, some more of you are joining us. Good morning, everybody. It is just about two minutes to 11, so we're gonna give it a couple more minutes before we get started. Welcome to those of you who have just joined us within the, within the past few moments. And uh, we'll get started here in just about two minutes. Okay, we'll get started in one more minute. We have a handful of additional people that have just joined us within the past couple of seconds here. So for those of you just signing in and joining us, welcome. We are going to get started in just about one minute uh, once we allow more time for some additional people to, to log in as I see the numbers uh, racking up because people are doing that as we speak. I see Karen Staborski has asked, will there be a recording available after the webinar? Absolutely. Uh, we are always going to, and I'm just typing that answer as well. We are always going to make sure to offer, um, to offer a recording after each of the webinars. So we will get that sent out. 
All right, I think it's time we can actually get started now. So let me just slide this over here. All right, good morning, everybody. Really great to see you. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Sapola, and I work as an, as an executive consultant at Decision Associates. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few. For those of you who are last week, thank you so much for joining us again. And for those of you who are new to this weekly webinar series, thank you so much for giving us a try. Uh, what I wanted to just cover is the fact that, number one, everybody's mics are muted just because I think it's easier to make sure we cut down on any background noise. So even if on your end it's not showing that your mic is muted, I automatically muted everybody's mics uh, just so that we didn't have any uh, conflicting background noise. However, at the very end during the last half hour when we get to the live Q&A, uh, I would ask that you, um, you know, be available for me to unmute you, which I have the capability of doing, if I need any further clarification about the question you're asking. Which leads me to the next thing I wanted to explain to you. So for those of you who were with us last week, this is going to be familiar, but again, for those of you who are new, I wanted to explain logistically how this is going to work. For the first half hour, we're going to be covering three unique topics related to workplace implications that have arisen from COVID-19. And during the last half hour, we open it up, we open up the floor to live Q&A. And the best way to do that is actually for people to type in their questions. You will see within the Zoom app, you have have the ability under Q and A to physically type in a question. So throughout the duration of this webinar, please feel free to type in questions as they pop into your mind. And then during the last half of this week's webinar, the same as we'll do every week moving forward, I will read through those questions and will answer those for you live. And if I don't have an answer for you off the top of my head, then I will definitely get back to everybody with the answer just like I did last week. All right, so we're ready to get started. Uh, so what we're going to cover today, you'll see, we are going to have 30 minutes of prepared material. And just to make sure everyone knows how this works, from week to week, we have three different topics that we cover for about 10 minutes each during the 30 minutes of prepared material. And these topics come from a combination of places. Many of you have been submitting emails privately to me, and all of you have my email uh, address. Also, I believe everybody should have my cell phone number, which I have included in my email signature line. And I've received some suggestions of topics from people who have said, hey, here's something I'd like to know more about. Is this something you could cover in the next session? In fact, some of today's topics are coming from that. Uh, another way that we determine what topics to include are based upon the conversations we're having with our clients here at Decision Associates. So for those of you who aren't terribly familiar with Decision Associates. It's not just me who works here, but also uh, my colleague, Aaron, whom I'll introduce you to in just a moment. He and I both are responsible for overseeing the human capital side of the business. And we've been talking to many, many, many business owners and managers just to help them through some of the things that are important to think about as we're all navigating COVID-19. So that's another way that we come up with topics. Um, and it's not just Aaron and myself. There are several others who work with us. Uh, I would definitely encourage you to check out our website, which again can also be found in my email signature line to see more about who works with us and their areas of expertise. So the topics we're going to be touching upon today, we're going to be touching upon the reality that so many of us are living, such as myself. You can see that I'm talking with you right now uh, during this webinar from my basement family room, and that is because this current crisis that we're all living through has a lot of us working remotely who otherwise haven't had to previously. And this is going to be intended to help you think through some very important considerations so that you can really intentionally create a culture that will deliver results in the wake of so many of us working virtually. 
and oftentimes, especially if you haven't done it before. The next topic we're going to touch upon is, you know, things to think about if your employee has tested positive for COVID-19. Now, let me just be clear. I think everybody knows this, but just in case, I am by no means a medical professional. I definitely don't want to pretend to be a medical professional. But what instead I have put together are employment-based considerations and things for you to be mindful of as it relates to this. So we're going to touch upon that. And uh, last but not least, we're going to come up with uh, some ways that you can nurture relationships with your laid off employees so they choose to come back to you after all of this has passed. All right, don't get going. What I wanted to do, I wanted to introduce, uh, last week we had a little bit of technical issues, so this week I wanted to have a chance for you to quote unquote meet Aaron Phillips, who works with me, and Aaron and I both uh, started in human resources exactly at the same time, 20 years ago. So uh, if you take a look at the slide that's in front of you, it gives you a flavor of the types of experience, background, industries, and expertise that both Aaron and I have. What I wanted to do right now is to actually introduce you to Aaron. So Aaron, um, all right, Aaron, are you there? I am, good morning. All right, thank you, Aaron. Good morning. If you could maybe just say a couple words of welcome to everybody before we get into the main content. Yeah, good morning. Thank you, everyone, first of all, for joining us. Um, Elizabeth and I, um, when, when this, a month ago, uh, when uh, the world was flipped on its head, uh, Elizabeth and I had, you know, had a call and she said, Aaron, I, I really want to start reaching out to our clients and talking and providing them content on a weekly basis. Are you okay with that? And I said, absolutely. Um, you know, she, uh, one of the things that w immediately when this uh, broke, w as an organization, we said, what are we going to do? And we have consistently over the last month just engaged all of our clients. Many of them are working. Uh, many of them are in manufacturing or, or, you know, very active and working. So they have issues that are different than the ones that uh, haven't received waivers and have had laid off uh, in their people. And so the, the hope for this weekly seminar and webinar is to provide a, a guidance in a, you know, in an environment where not only we can share information from you, but your questions can actually guide us, you know, give us uh, guidance as to how we can help uh, other organizations in future uh, seminars and webinars. And so thank you all for joining us, uh, especially on today, a, a special, a special uh, happy birthday to Elizabeth, who's celebrating her oh. birthday today. She told me she's 25. And uh, I, I, am. Am. I am. And so yes, a special happy birthday to Elizabeth. So <laughs> thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, really excited uh, that, to have everyone on with us today and uh, really uh, appreciative of your work in uh, getting this material prepared for everyone. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate it. And uh, also too, I want to say thank you to many of you who've joined us, even though it's Good Friday and many of you may have the, the day off. So we appreciate you carving out an hour of your time to spend with us. We hope it's worthwhile. All right. So the first topic we're going to touch upon, help. COVID-19 has my team working remotely. So we want to just go over some best practices for you coming from our perspective as HR executives who've had to manage remote teams. In addition to that, these are best practices coming from some unique nuances that have emerged since COVID-19. And let's first take a look at our new reality. And when I say our new reality, I mean really as a nation and really not just the nation, but also across the world, many, many many, many millions of organizations have been thrust into an arrangement that many have been slow to embrace. And that arrangement I'm talking about is the arrangement of working remotely. So as with anything, there are pros and there are cons. And as you can see, there are several benefits. Now, certainly this is not an all exhaustive list of pros and cons, but I think it's important before we talk about, you know, some best practices for you to consider to help you with this new reality. I do think it's important that we acknowledge the things that are in our benefit as employers 
but also the things that make it harder for us to operate and harder for us to do our job. So as you can see, some of the benefits that I listed, it gives us the ability to increase savings from an operational perspective. Um, in addition to that, it helps us in many ways to increase productivity. Now, some, some of you may think, Okay, sure, but on the flip side, it can also make productivity more difficult. Absolutely, it can, but it also gives us a benefit of really allowing people to work in solidarity um, at times when they need to and be as productive as they possibly can. It also increases the ability to collaborate. And again, some of you may be thinking, hmm, isn't it easier to collaborate in person? Not always. In fact, we're gonna talk about that. And let's not forget, Take a look, higher retention rate of employees. Now, when you think about it, right, I, I'm sure many of you have heard of the future of work and that was something that was real common to be talked about. Lots and lots of seminars were put out um, within the past and years. And the future of work really talks about, amongst many other things, how to attract and retain the next generation of workers. Well, I'll tell you that uh, I've been doing a lot of research on this, and up to 25% of employees say, hey, I am more willing to stay on board with my employer if they are willing to allow me to have a remote work arrangement. Now, right now, many of you have had your hands forced at doing that, but it's something that really begs the question, hey, is it smart for us to consider doing this after COVID-19 is behind us? In addition to that, from a recruitment perspective, it gives us a much bigger pool of candidates from which to recruit. Uh, the, the world is your oyster, literally, when it comes to recruiting candidates. You're no longer bound, if you're open to allowing remote work, you're no longer longer bound to only hiring people who are willing to physically relocate to your area, which I know is a tough thing for some of us who live here in the northeastern part of the United States. It's not always the, the most attractive place that people necessarily want to relocate because of the weather, such as the beautiful five to six inches of snow I'm looking at out of my window today in the middle of April. Um, and then another obvious benefit for those of you on this call, hey, you're actually able to continue operating amidst COVID-19. Can you imagine if this happened 20 years ago when working remotely wasn't even an option? It would have been a completely different picture. Now, some of the drawbacks, obviously minimal or in the case of what we're all living right now, zero face-to-face -face interaction, and that can impact connectedness and trust, especially as it goes on longer and longer. It can be really dicey and tri tricky to navigate and make sure everyone's crystal clear on priorities and goals. Communication, if there are technology technology glitches. Communication can be tricky. And as with any form of communication other than face-to-face -face communication, it does make it uh, more possible for a misinterpretation to occur. And also too, let's not forget the last one, the majority I would say of business owners and managers they don't know how to effectively manage a remote workforce, but yet here we are, ready or not, we're figuring it out. All right, so the one thing I want you to remember and to think about when, uh, when we talk about the key to building a strong virtual culture is intentionality. And basically what I'm talking about is you can't, it is not business as usual, right? And I think everyone on this call has probably re realized that. So you can no longer just assume you can handle things in exactly the same way you had done before. Instead, you have to be very purposeful. You have to be very intentional about how you're going about it. And when I say be intentional, I'm also talking about, hey, we've acknowledged the benefits, we've acknowledged the drawbacks, and I'm sure there are even more to add to the list unique to your organizational structure. But you have to acknowledge those instead of turning a blind eye, and you have to find a way to balance them so that you can come up with a way of doing this that keeps in mind and takes into account the good and the bad, all right? And then the other thing I wanna point out, it is so important for communication to feel real. And let me give a perfect example of that. I don't exactly have the most uh, corporate looking background here, and I very easily could have done this webinar where there is no video involved, and it's strictly just you hearing my voice over a slide deck. Instead, I really want to model the best practices that we are trying to convey to our clients, which is, you know, let your guard down a little bit, be authentic, be real. 
invites the people you're communicating with into your home quite literally, right? So you can actually see uh, my background. You can see what my family room looks like. And it really makes it more personable, makes the communication more real, as opposed to, you know, trying to put on something that might not be as authentic. So here are some best practices that we are hoping will serve as a blueprint for you. Um, you know, the first thing you're going to need to do, and even if the horse is already out of the, out of the barn, so to speak, and you already have people working remotely, it's not too late to go back and still put some of these things into place, okay? So don't panic if you haven't done these things. But really it's important to not only prepare your managers to work remotely, but also your employees to work remotely. And, uh, excuse me, my nose is running. Um, See, I'm being real with you now too. Um, so when I'm talking about preparing them to work remotely, what am I talking about? It's really important to communicate ability guidelines, okay? I'm, I'm sharing these best practice recommendations, not only from the perspective of me having managed remote work teams, teams who have been all over the globe, not even just here in the US, but also from the perspective of once upon a time, having been in a situation where I worked remotely and I was remembering how it felt when some things were not in place, which made it more difficult for me to work effectively. So I'm really drawing from those different perspectives of being on both sides of the table, so to speak. So communicate accountability guidelines. In other words, make sure that everyone's on the same page. What are the work hours supposed to be? What uh, are you expecting in terms of accessibility? What are you expecting in terms of their responsiveness and being available for calls? It's very difficult right now for many of us because if, if many of you and many of your employees are like me, I have three children upstairs who, um, who I have to tend to throughout the day, help them with their schooling that they have to continue. I have a spouse that lives here with me who's also working remotely full time. So it's not necessarily going to be a case where your employee can instantly respond, but just make sure you convey what your expectations are. Also too, a lot of times when people work remotely, they can actually feel more pressure and they can actually feel like they never stop working because you're literally living where you work. So a lot of times I've heard employees, my former employees tell me, gosh, you know, do you expect me to respond at one in the morning when you send me an email? Um, or, or is it okay if I wait till the next day? I always would say, you know, stick within your core work hours. And because I understand that my work arrangement has to be unique and sometimes because of the other things I'm juggling at home when I work remotely, uh, I might have to send emails in the middle of the night because that's when I actually have free time to do so. Um, doesn't mean that you need to respond at that time. So just make sure you're clear on what's expected. Also too, I can't emphasize this enough. I remember this was one of my frustrations when I was working remotely in the past, make sure they have the tools to make it easier. So um, you're going to want to make sure you provide different cloud-based technology options so that even if from a technology perspective, your workplace is not suited, uh, you know, to, to accommodate a remote work arrangement. At least there are other technologies, and I gave examples of some that are available for you to use. Now, another tool that you see on there is Mike. Microsoft Workplace Analytics. And this is an excellent tool for your managers and also can be shared with your employees because it actually tracks accountability and it actually tracks efficiency throughout your workday. So you can actually see how much time they're spending each day on various tasks. And that's really, really helpful as well. It's also important to establish structured communication and I always recommend a daily structured check-in. I know Aaron and I, uh, we check in with each other on a daily basis um, and we work very, very closely together. In addition to that, it's important to have scheduled weekly one-on-ones. Um, make sure that you have rules of engagement established. So in other words, is it expected that they always use video conferencing or sometimes can they use instant messaging or talk via phone or email or text? What are your expectations? Make sure everyone's clear on that and make sure that you 
everyone on your team is open and transparent and respectful of when the best time is to be reached. Because as I said earlier, don't forget, a lot of us are juggling things other than work amidst everything that we're dealing with, such as educating your own children upstairs, making sure they're stay staying up to speed on schoolwork um, and, and things of that nature. So make sure that you respect and take the time to ask when the best time is to reach them. And last but not least, provide a manager's toolkit. I actually have taken some time to create a toolkit that I will send you after today's webinar along with the recorded webinar and the slide deck. So when I say a manager's toolkit, give them the information, give them the tools to help them manage more properly. All right. So the other things I want to talk about, now that we've prepared your managers, we've prepared your employees to, to work remotely, let's talk about just a handful of additional best practices. First and foremost, don't get lazy about keeping the why at the forefront. And when I'm talking about the why, I'm talking about at the end of the day, what is the big picture um, you know, vision or goal or objective that you want them to focus on? If you are crystal clear on that, and not just you as the leader, but if you make sure that your supervisors, your employees, everybody is crystal clear about the big picture goal that you want them to focus on, whatever that may be unique to your organization, make sure that because that's going to help them figure out where to focus their energy. And it can be tough to do that with all the chaos that is surrounding us. In addition to that, make sure you send structured agendas ahead of time. <laughs> whether or not there's COVID-19, whether or not you're working remotely, unstructured meetings are a huge waste of time. And as a manager, will cause your cred credibility to go downwards, at least from the perspective of your um, employees. So make sure don't convince yourself, oh, I don't have time to come up with an agenda. No, take 10 minutes, even if you only have 10 minutes, but put together an agenda that includes specific action items, task owners, uh, meeting minutes afterwards, so everyone's clear on who's doing what, and also specific goals. And again, I will send you a simple template that I've created for use after today's webinar, among the other things I'll be sending you. Make sure you schedule in some realness, schedule in some fun. I don't even know if realness is a real word, <laughs> but make sure you take some time to schedule it in. What am I talking about? Many of us have participated in virtual happy hours. Uh, movie nights. I have a really cute idea. It's called, um, and this is something that I always did with my team when um, we were managing in person, right? But it's called Inspired. And basically, don't throw that out the window. Take some time to do some story sharing. And basically what we did is we went around the, the room before our weekly meeting, and I asked every single person, and I did it as well, to just take two to three minutes to share something that really inspired them uh, during that week and tie it back to the focus of the organization or what your department's going through or something that you know everybody can really feel connected to. So again, that takes two or three minutes and it's something that is fun to do and meaningful and brings a more of a you know real connection even when you're working remotely. And again, I'm gonna send you a list of some additional ideas after today. Don't overcomplicate things with technology. I know that I've talked to some clients, uh, and even here in our office, we've said, oh, you know, there's this platform or that platform. I wonder what we should use. You know, the best practice that I can convey to you is do not have any more than three platforms that you're using. Although there's a lot of really cool, funky technology out there that you can use, please avoid unnecessary confusion, not only for you, but for your employees, for your managers, for your IT department, and stick to no more than three pl platforms. Also to centralize communication and avoid water cooler talk. So what am I talking about? Well, even though there's no single water cooler we can all gather around right now, the gossip still happens, the chatter still happens back and forth. And make sure that you have centralized methods of communication, uh, you know, like I said, using Facebook, um, they have some applications for employers to use for communication. And you can create specific pages unique to, you know, uh, team communication within that organization or just for fun communication or 
questions that people want answered. So find a way, whatever works for you, to centralize communication, because the more you can over communicate, the less of a likelihood there's going to be gossip or people coming up with their own conclusions. And make sure you're really considerate of the environmental challenges your employees are facing. So be clear with them. What do you expect in terms of how they should be dressing? Um, you want to make sure they're wearing clothes. <laughs> I, I'm laughing, but I actually talked to someone, a business owner, um, actually a nonprofit leader earlier this week, who said that they were on a call, a Zoom call, and somebody was shirtless. Luckily, it was a man. Um, <laughs> but you want to make sure you're clear on attire expectations, especially for people who might not be used to working remotely and, and maybe aren't in the most um, you know, senior level or professional positions, um, and they don't always know, you know, how the, the rules of engagement. And make sure they know, do they always have to have their video camera on, or sometimes can they instead, you know, not do that? Can they, um, you know, do you need them in a place where there's a guarantee of no background noise or disruptions, such as, you know, dogs barking, children in the background, or, you know, is it a little bit more loose and lax? So be very clear and intentional on that. All right, prepared topic number two. Your employee tested positive for COVID-19. Now what? All right, so first and foremost, let me remind you of what I said in the beginning of this webinar. I am not, I never have been, I never will be a medical professional. The focus that we are has to do with workplace compliance considerations, okay? So what I am is I am a compliance expert and Erin is as well. And as you know, you, you've seen our background, you've seen our credentialing and our education and expertise. So we are only taking it from that angle. All right, so I wanna make sure you're very clear on that. Uh, you know, certainly we're going to urge you and you'll see here to confer with other people who are experts from a medical perspective, but from a compliance perspective, there are two pieces of legislation that I wanna make sure everybody knows is gonna really guide how you handle it, okay? First of all, and I apologize, I noticed a little typo. I have the word the twice. Uh, the first one is the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. I'm sure many, if not all of you have heard of this. And the ADA really has privacy rules that restrict you as an employer from sharing personal private health information of a specific employee. So what you can and should do is inform your employees that a possible exposure has occurred in the workplace, but you mustn't ever disclose any identifying information about the individual who tested positive, okay? So that's a compliance consideration as it relates to the ADA. The other piece of, piece of legislation that's going to really dictate how to respond to something like this is called HIPAA. And HIPAA is short for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which of course passed in 1996. So for this, I want to make sure people are clear because we, we've all, it's been pounded into our brains, HIPAA, HIPAA, HIPAA privacy. And you're absolutely right. We cannot disclose information or identify information about people related to their medical um, you know, situation. But I think it's important that everybody knows that there is one allowable disclosure by you as an employer. And that allowable disclosure is to public health authorities to the extent relevant to the authority and purview of the public health authorities. So in other words, it's going to be very important for you to understand as an employer that you, you may be asked, in fact, I'm 99% sure you will be asked to disclose and you can and need to disclose that information of, you know, positive test results for COVID-19 as requested by state, it has to be officially requested, of course, right, by state and local health departments, HHS, Health and Human Services, or the CDC, the Center, Center for Disease Control, as appropriate. So once again, that might be a new piece of information for those of you, because you might think otherwise, oh, I can't tell anyone, no matter who it is. No, you can tell um, there's one allowable disclosure, and that's what we just covered here. All right. So now let's talk about some practical considerations. Let's talk about what you can tell your employees. And what you can tell your employees is, you know, you wanna to stick to the facts. So you wanna provide factual information 
about COVID-19, but you want to take this information, not facts as you see it or as you're deriving from, you know, random websites on the web. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, but you also want to, you, or rather you instead, you want to make sure you're providing factual information that's only provided by local, state, and federal health officials, okay? That way we can make sure it truly is factual information. You also want to make sure that you assure your employees that their health and safety is absolutely the most important in your eyes as an employer. And you want to educate them about the best practices to avoid COVID-19. And again, you don't want to just come up willy-nilly with best practices as you think you understand them, but you want to use factual recommendations and factual resources and guidance provided by local, state, and federal health resources. And again, in case I haven't emphasized the word factual enough, <laughs> you want to make sure that all communication is fact-based and you only rely on information from the experts to avoid causing panic. This is the last thing we want to do as an employer is cause an unnecessary panic. So how can we do that? We can stick to the facts and we can stick only the information provided by your local, state, and federal resources. All right, here's what else you can do. You have to remember that every case is unique and again, you're going to need to work with your local health department in conjunction with your state's Department of Labor. Every state, every county has different methodology that they've developed and also some different requirements in terms of how to handle positive COVID-19 with uh, not only with individuals from a medical perspective, but also in care management, case management, but also of course in, in the eyes of um, how you are to handle it in your role as an employer. So you want to make sure that you contact your local health department and you work with them and let them guide that relationship in conjunction with your state's Department of Labor. So that's what you can do. All right. So once again, um, you know, being prepared, being intentional, that is the key. The more you can plan in advance, that will help you if it happens. And we actually have an example of this from one of our clients that again will be included in the email of materials I send out to those of you who registered for today's webinar. And specifically, our client, uh, Burner International, they shared a checklist that they created um, and they gave us permission to share it with you. And this checklist is something they created before, you know, well in advance of, of how much this whole topic has blown up throughout the nation. And this is a checklist that they came up with to help guide them for, um, you know, what to do if someone should test positive or if there's a possible exposure. The best word, uh, the best words of advice I can give you is something that came from actually a doctor, and I'm looking it up, a doctor that I reached out to who owns uh, his own private practice. And here's what he said. Um, he said, and he's a doctor, I should tell you, that prior to starting his own private practice, spent 25 years working as a physician in the military in the field and having to actually provide medical care on the front lines, um, you know, in times of, of war. Um, so he said, I'm going to share with you a couple of things for people who have never been in a full up crisis. Number one, it is so important to use checklists if they have them. And perfect as they may be, that's a great place to start. Take notes and adjust to them. If you have, um, let's see, let's see, one more thing. He also said, um, the worst thing that you can do is not to lean forward and put some plans in place to do something early and get ahead of it. People will not fault you if what you've come up with is not perfect. It's when you don't do anything that gets scrutinized later. So I thought those were really good words of advice that he shared with me. And again, um, important enough that I wanted to read them word for word verbatim, coming from the perspective of a medical professional who has certainly um, practiced medicine in times of chaos and on the front lines of war, which a lot of us feel, <laughs> especially when you watch the news with the medical uh, professionals, that there have been a lot of similarities drawn to that. All right, so prepared topic number three, nurturing the relationship with your laid off employees so they actually choose to come back. So here's the reality that many, if not all of us are facing, right? 
The reality is that those of us who've recently laid off employees, we are already thinking about how we can bring them back. The market has literally changed overnight. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is we used to be in a nice cozy place as employers of, hey, you know, there are so many more, um, or I'm sorry, we, we used to be in a place, not in a great place as employers in terms of, um, you know, we have this great position, but it's hard to find the best of the best candidates because, you know, the employment, unemployment rate is down so low. Well, it's totally been flipped over on its belly. And for example, I'm hiring, yes, I'm hiring for a high level position right now for one of my clients. And I've had about 200 applicants for this position. That is wildly different than anything that would have happened a month ago. Um, so it's important to understand that the market has changed overnight. And you might think, oh, that's great. So we're in a great position. Even if someone chooses not to come back, that's fine because we'll have lots of other people who need jobs. Well, let's be wise about this. Number one, you already have invested in training and nurtured relationships with your employees who've been laid off, okay? So why let that talent walk out the door and be picked up by somebody else? Number two, don't forget that for some of us who might have uh, positions that are not your, uh, or have had to lay off employees uh, from positions that aren't your highest paid positions, it's very possible that, that what they're earning on unemployment could actually be more than what they're earning coming back to you. So it could cause employees to I might have other. And that is something that I know those of us who are working back in 2008, uh, we had to deal with that as well because the unemployment benefits were so rich. So it's important to have authentic and regular communication. That is the key. Bottom line, they have to feel that they, and know, not just feel, but know and see that they still matter and that they haven't just been abandoned and forgotten about. So here are some best practices so that they choose you all over again. All right. Um, you know, and, and I'm drawing a lot of this again, not only from the perspective of best practices, things that we have personally used or I have personally used in my own um, career over the years with employees who we've had to lay off from time to time, but also from the perspective of talking to people who've been laid off right now during this um, COVID-19 situation that we're all living through and asking them how they feel, asking them what their employers are doing to communicate with them. And you would be surprised how many employees haven't um, heard anything <laughs> since being laid off a few weeks ago. They never even received their uh, COBRA notification paperwork. So they've been trying to figure out what to do, what options are available so they can still have, have health benefits. And they're just literally feeling like they meant nothing. And they are just reeling from being stressed out, not knowing how they're gonna feed their families, stressed by how tough it is to get through the unemployment systems, right? Um, through their respective state to even file for unemployment. So remember, these are human beings. These are lives of your employees that have been turned upside down. Keep those lines of communication open. Provide periodic updates. Don't just wait till they ask, call out of desperation to ask you a question. And by the way, a lot of these people who I've spoken with said, and I don't even wanna bother them to call them because I'm sure they must be so busy. That breaks my heart. That is so sad. So make sure you provide periodic updates on your respective situation amidst COVID-19. Schedule time in your calendar to check in weekly. And when you're checking in, show genuine empathy, show genuine care, and give them that emotional support to keep them motivated during these tough times. Don't rely upon an impersonal generic uh, letter or email, okay? Be personable. That is so, so important. And make sure that when I say your communication should be personal to each impacted employee, what I'm talking about is, you know, ask how, if, if you know somebody, um, you know, has a child, let's say, with, you know, medical issues or medical concerns, say, hey, I, I just want you to know we're continuing, you know, my, my husband and I are continuing to keep you in our thoughts and our prayers. This has to be so scary for you. Uh, please let me know if there's anything that I can do to help. Um, you know, little nuggets of personalized information, make it personal to them. That's going to go a very long way. 
And also too, you know, some of you may be hearing this and thinking, well, Elizabeth, we had to lay off a hundred employees. First of all, I'm very sorry for you that you had to do that. I know this is a terrible time to, for all of us who are facing that. But if the number of your employees who've been laid off is just simply too many for just one individual to follow up with, enlist the help of your other managers who, but don't pick managers who you know have horrendous interpersonal communication skills or who you know maybe don't have the best relationship with the people that the particular individuals that you're asking them to follow up with, but be very savvy and smart and compassionate about who you enlist the help of so that they can convey that genuine authentic message of care and concern when they are helping you to reach out on a weekly basis but you really should have weekly touch points and i think everyone knows this but just in case you don't you can't ask them to do work when they're laid off so don't even ask them a work-related question that's a huge huge no-no i just want to make sure you knew that all right, so um, that's it for the prepared topics. Now we're going to transition over to the Q&A portion. And we have about 20 minutes for that. I will check to see what questions have been coming through. We will check that in just a moment. But before we do that, uh, because as you know from the email invitation you received as well as to these weekly webinars, as well as from the reminder email I sent out, if you ever have a question, please send it to me and I will look into it and I will address it for everybody's benefit as part of these weekly webinars. In addition to that, um, I will share, share the answer with everybody as I get it once you send it um, to me prior to each weekly webinar. So the question that you see here, this is something that I wanted to know if you heard any $5,000 hazard pay for essential workers. Do you have any information yet? And yes, I do have information. It still hasn't made it past the Senate. And um, so, so I just want you to know, I'm gonna share with you on the next slide the details of what's being proposed, but please don't get yourselves in a tizzy as you read what's being proposed and think, oh wait, when did this go into effect? Is it definitely going into effect? No, it still hasn't made it past the Senate. So it's still being debated. It still needs to be voted upon and finessed before if, uh, until if and when it even makes it uh, past the Senate. But the details of what's being proposed are something that is, would be potentially part of phase four of the coronavirus relief bill. And here's what's being proposed. Again, hasn't made it past the Senate yet. It's called the COVID-19 Heroes Fund. And what's being proposed is that essential workers could be able to get a $25,000 raise. Um, and basically that would be intended to reward, retain and recruit essential workers. And basically what it would do is it would give $25,000 a premium, a pandemic premium pay for these frontline essential workers until the end of 2020. So workers would get an additional $13 per hour on top of their regular wages, and it would be capped at $25,000. So they wouldn't get you know, a $25,000 check from the government or anything like that, or, nor would you be asked to do that. But instead, if this passes, which it hasn't, okay, has not passed, but if this passes, they would earn an additional $13 per hour on top of what they're currently earning to a maximum cap of $25,000. And that would be available to anyone making less than $200,000 per year. And if you make more, it would be capped, um, more than that, it would be capped at $5,000. It would also, if approved, if passed, it would also provide a one-time $15,000 hiring bonus to attract and secure people uh, who, again, were deemed essential frontline workers and they're hoping that it would help to address severe staffing sort shortages that are that we see all over the news um, for those frontline workers all right so I'm going to turn it over let's see all right so um, I have a question from Allison and she just said this is my first session excellent Thank you, Allison. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, she wants to know if she can access the recording from the first session. Absolutely, Allison. I'll be willing to do that for you. I have your contact information from when you registered for this session, so I will definitely be sure to send you a recording of the first session. All right, very good. Uh, let's see. I don't have any more questions that have popped up. 
Now that either means I've done one heck of a good job conveying content, or um, maybe it means that you are just burnt out from all of this and uh, thinking about how you can start your Easter weekend. And I hope everybody has excellent plans for the weekend. And yes, Aaron, um, my colleague Aaron, he just sent me a little message that said test to make sure I can see questions as they're being typed. And yes, I absolutely can. So before we, oh, okay, we got a new question coming from Courtney. So let me just read Courtney's question. All right. In terms of who is deemed an essential worker for the Possible Heroes Fund, would that apply to any businesses working during the shutdown? No, 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 no. Um, great question, Courtney. Yeah, because I, I can, I think I can hear the panicked, uh, panicked heartbeats of many of you <laughs> on this call after I shared with you about the, you know, potential Heroes Fund um, <laughs> legislation. No, it doesn't apply to anyone who you deem essential respectively within your organization to report to work or any business such as certain manufacturing business, for example, that, um, or agriculture, like you said, Courtney, in your example, <clears throat> that have been allowed to continue working. It, it, they're gonna be very, very specific and it's primarily going to be healthcare workers um, as well as law enforcement. Uh, I will tell you that I was reading and believe it or not, some other potential positions that would be potentially included would actually be people uh, who work in the grocery store as well. Uh, so those would be potentially considered essential, but we're going to have to wait and see what passes, uh, what if anything passes. We're going to have and by next week, the details of this because it's been passed. I don't know, but you can trust that I will keep everybody up to speed on that. Good question. All right, so let's see if we have any other questions. And we do. Um, Allison, hello, Allison again. <laughs> so, um, Allison's question, and you're welcome, Courtney. Allison's question putting my two key employees on part time status so that they may, may be eligible for some unemployment compensation. Any special considerations I should bear in mind? Absolutely. So, um, Allison, there are some things that I don't know about your respective organization, obviously, and I could certainly talk to you offline. But as far as putting certain employees on part-time status, uh, and I also don't know, Allison, what state you live in off the top of my head, because there are some differences in relationship to that. So I will follow up with you offline and give you more personalized, individualized guidance on this. But there is something called shared work unemployment benefits that some states offer. Uh, uh, and even those, and I know Pennsylvania and New York offer it, but depending on the state, they, uh, they might have different requirements about how to go about it. So that's why I'm going to have to follow up with you personally offline, Allison, and just give you better guidance on that. But as a whole, yes, that is a potential possibility where you can put people on part-time status, and then they would actually receive unemployment compensation based upon uh, the change in their um, in their earnings. So they would just receive partial unemployment benefits. And that would be dictated by how much it is that you cut their pay um, or cut their hours, I'll say, based upon their part-time status. But I will follow up with Allison. And for, for everybody else's reference, remember what I always do is I will send you a Q&A document that it literally catalogs every question that we've been asked and the response so that you can skim through it and you can see if any questions relate to you or of interest to you and you can see the response. So Allison, I will capture your question on that document and share it out with everybody. All right, um, John Miller, whoops, I zipped on past you. Hi, John. Uh, if an employee is concerned about being infected with COVID-19 and does not want to work, are they eligible for unemployment compensation? Great question. And the guidance that I'm going to provide for you on this is guidance that would apply federally, okay? So I read the federal guidance as it relates to this. And the way it works, yes or no. Let me explain that. If they're just randomly concerned about being infected and no other you know, underlying conditions that they have, which could potentially qualify them for FMLA, 
okay, um, and leave under FMLA and some of the other leaves that we talked about last week related to COVID-19, they're out of luck. They're choosing not to work. They have work available to them. Just simply being concerned about becoming effect, I'm sorry, infected <laughs> doesn't automatically make it so that you can get unemployment compensation. So I'll include this question, John, so I can have on that Q&A document so everyone can see this because this I actually think it might already be on there, but I'll make sure it is nonetheless. But basically, you want to make sure that you understand or that you know, are there other conditions that or other reasons that might qualify under FMLA for them to take some leave time that would potentially be paid um, based upon some of the new legislation that just came down the pike uh, from COVID-19? But just straight up, hey, I'm worried, I don't want to get infected. No, no, you wouldn't be. All right, so the next question. Oops, gosh, I'm going really fast here as I'm trying to zip through these, I'm sorry. Um, do you have suggestions for curtailing and how responsible an employer is to control employees discussing other fellow employees who might have contracted COVID-19? Great, great question. Love that question. Um, so I would say for that, bear with me, I'm so sorry. It looks like my birthday present from Mother Nature was not only snow, but also a little cold that I'm getting, not COVID-19, but just a regular cold, I think. So um, for that, I would handle that very, very seriously. And the guidance that I would provide is I would, in, as soon as you hear of that or hear of someone who's having those conversations, that could potentially um, you know, spread unnecessary panic or certainly violate an employee's um, or create rumors, I would absolutely pull those employees to the side on an individu individual basis and make it abundantly clear to them that that is not to be tolerated. And I would even um, you know, consider, just because of the potential implications of this, for the person who's being talked about, I would even consider formally documenting it through your performance improvement plan or progressive discipline program, whatever it is your organization has. And I would definitely, um, you know, make it abundantly clear that is not going to be tolerated. Uh, you know, make sure that they know you're documenting this conversation. And if they have, if if you hear of or or catch them doing that ever again in the future, you're going to be following the progressive disciplinary measures that are outlined in your handbook um, up to and including the potential of termination. That's very, very serious and you want to definitely take a, you know, a pretty strong approach for that. Absolutely. Uh, and I think we are done. All right. So thank you so much. You guys have been amazing. And I love all the interaction. I love the questions that you're asking. Keep them coming even after today's webinar. If you know of other employers or if you know of other HR professionals who are trying to navigate this situation, please let them know that they're invited to join this as well. You can feel free to either share the invitation when you get it on a weekly basis or you can email me and say, hey, you know, here's someone that you might want to add to the list, but there is obviously no fee to join. And truly, this is just so that we can create a community of leaders in this pandemic that we're all going through together. And at least from a workplace perspective, um, make sure that everyone feels supported because it is so important. These are definitely uncertain times, uh, uncharted territory, and uh, and the only way we're going to get through it is by all of us with our respective areas of expertise lending a helping hand and using that to help others. So thank you. Stay safe. Have a wonderful Easter. And, uh, and God bless. All right. Have a great day. Thank you.